Snell's window. In the clear waters of the open sea, the light of the sun wells downwards from the surface in an inverted cone that ends in the beholder's eye. The base of this cone is a transparent disk that hangs above the observer's head like a floating halo. It is through this prism, known as Snell's window, that the oceanic dolphin perceives the world beyond the water. In submersion, this circular portal follows it everywhere, creating a single clear opening in the unbroken expanse of shimmering silver that forms the water's surface as seen from below. Rivers like the Ganga and the Brahmaputra shroud this window with a curtain of silt. In their oculated waters, light loses its directionality within a few centimeters of the surface. Beneath this lies a flowing stream of suspended matter in which visibility does not extend beyond an arm's length. With no lighted portal to point the way, top and bottom, up and down become very quickly confused. As if to address this, the gangetic dolphin habitually swims on its side, parallel to the surface, with one of its lateral fins trailing the bottom, as though to anchor itself in its darkened world by keeping the hold upon its floor. In the open sea, Pia would have had no difficulty dealing with a fall such as the one she had just sustained. She was a competent swimmer and would have been able to hold her own against the current. It was the disorientation caused by the peculiar conditions of light in the silted water that made her panic. With her breath running out, she felt herself to be enveloped inside a cocoon of eerily glowing murk and could not tell whether she was looking up or down. In her head, there was a smell or rather a metallic savor she knew to be, not blood, but inhaled mud. It had entered her mouth, her nose, her throat, her eyes. It had become a shroud closing in on her, folding her in its cloudy wrappings. She threw her hands at it, scratching, lunging, and pummeling, but its edges seemed always to recede like the slippery walls of placental sack. Then she felt something brush against her back, and at that moment, there was no touch that would not have made her respond as if to the probing of reptilian snout. Her body began to twitch convulsively, and she tried to look over her shoulder, but could see nothing except that impenetrable sepia glow. Although her limbs were growing rigid and her strength was ebbing, she tried to defend herself by hitting out and flailing her arms. But then something came shooting through the water and struck her in the face. She felt herself being propelled forward and was unable to resist the sudden to resist. Suddenly her head broke free and there was a lightness on her skin that she knew to be the touch of air. But still she could not breathe. Her nose and her mouth were swamped with mud and water. Thrashing her arms, she tried to lift herself from the water, only to be struck on the face again by another powerful blow. Then, to her amazement, a pair of arms appeared around her chest. A hand caught hold of her neck, jerking back her head, and another set of teeth were clamped against her own. There was a sucking sensation in her mouth and something seemed to shoot out of her gullet. A moment later, she felt a whiff of air in her throat and began to gasp for more. A clasped arm was holding her upright in the water, and on her left shoulder was a sharp, prickling sensation. Even as she was struggling to swallow mouthfuls of air, it filtered through to her consciousness that it was the fisherman who was holding her and that his stubble was abrading her skin. The stinging seemed to clear her mind and she forced herself to loosen her panicked muscles, calming her body to the point where he could begin to swim. The current had carried them a long way from the boat and she knew that he would not be able to tow her unless she lay still. Rolling over in the water, she arched her back to stay afloat and hooked her arm through his making herself almost weightless. 
Even then, the push of the current was like a gravitational force, and she could feel him straining for each inch, as though he were dragging her up a steep slope. At last, when her hands were on the gunwale, he corkscrewed his body under her, pushing her out of the water and into the boat. She landed on her belly and instantly a jet of swallowed water rose to choke her gorge. Suddenly, it was as if she were drowning all over again. With water streaming from her mouth and her nose, she clutched at her throat, clawing at the base of her neck with her fingers as though she were trying to loosen a garret. Then again, his hands gripped her shoulders, flipping her over. Throwing a leg ag across her hips, he weighed her down with his body and fastened his mouth on hers, sucking the water from her throat and pumping air into her lungs. When her windpipe was clear again, he broke away. She heard him spitting into the water and knew he was cleaning the taste of her vomit from his mouth. As the rhythm of her breathing returned, she caught the sound of voices and opened her eyes. It was the forest guard and his friend, the pilot. They were leering at her from the launch, lounging against the rails and exchanging whispers as they watched her fighting for breath. When the guard saw she had opened her eyes, he began to point to his watch and to the sun, which was now slipping below the horizon in a blaze of crimson. At first she could make no sense of these gesticulations, but when he st started to make beckoning motions, she understood. Darkness was fast approaching and he wanted her to hurry up and get back to the launch so they could proceed to wherever it was they were going. The abruptness of this summons made Pia's hackles rise. The man had ev evidently assumed she had no choice but to follow his orders, that she would put up with whatever demands he chose to make. From the start, she had sensed a threat from the guard and his friend. She knew that to return to the launch in these circumstances would be an acknowledgement of helplessness. If she placed herself in their power now, she would be marked as an acquiescent victim. She could not board that launch again, and yet... What else could she do? A word flashed through her mind, taking her by surprise. She sat up and tried to enunciate it before it could escape. The fisherman was squatting in the bow, bare-bodied except for his loincloth. He had torn off his lungy before plunging into the water, and the little boy was using it now to mop wa the water from his head. When Pia sat up, the boy whispered something and the fisherman turned to look at her. Quickly, before the word could slip away, she said, Lucy Barry? He frowned as if to say that he hadn't heard her right, so she said the word again, Lucy Barry, and added, Mashima? At this, he gave her a nod that seemed to indicate he knew those names. Pia's eyes widened. Could it really be that he knew this woman? To confirm, she said again, Mashima? He nodded once more and gave her a smile, as if to say, yes, he knew exactly whom she was referring to. But she still could not tell whether he had understood the full import of what she was asking of him. So just to be sure, she made a sign, pointing first to herself, then at the horizon, to tell him she wanted him to take her there, in his boat. He nodded again and added, as if in confirmation, Lucy Bari. Yes. Shutting her eyes in relief, she unclenched her stomach and let her breath flow out. Standing on the launch, the guard snapped his fingers at Pia as if to wake her from a long sleep. She pulled herself to her feet, leaning against the boat's bamboo awning for support, and signaled to him to pass over her backpacks. He handed over the first without deemer, and it was only when she asked for the second that he understood she was not coming back to the launch. His mark changed into a scowl and he began to shout, not at her but at the fisherman, whose response was nothing more than a quiet shrug and a murmur. 
This seemed to make the guard angrier still, and he began to threaten the fisherman with gestures of his fist. Pia tried to intervene with a shout of her own. It's not his fault. Why are you yelling at him? Now unexpectedly, the pilot added his voice to hers. He too began to remonstrate with the guard, pointing to the horizon to remind him of the fast approaching sunset. This jolted the guard's attention back to Pia. He held up her second backpack and rubbed his fingers and th his finger and thumb together to indicate that it would not be given over without a payment. Her money, she remembered, was inside her waterproofed money belt. She reached for the zip and was relieved to find the belt to be intact, its contents undamaged. She counted out the equivalent of a day's hire for the boat and a day's wages for the guard. Then, as, as she was handing the money over just to ensure herself of a quick riddance, she added a few extra notes. Without another word, the guard grabbed the money and tossed over her backpack. She could scarcely believe she had succeeded in ridding herself of them. She had expected more scenes and more yelling, fresh demands for money. On cue, as if to show her that she had not got off lightly, the guard held up her walkman. He had managed to extricate it from her belongings before handing them over. Then, to celebrate his theft, he began to make lurid gestures, pumping his pelvis and milking his finger with his fist. Pia was as, uh, Pia was as oblivious to these obscenities as to the loss of her music. She would just be she would be grateful just to see the guard and his friend depart. She shut her eyes and waited till the sound of the launch had faded away.